This video is part of a study series titled Biblical Salvation Settled Once and for All. Please see the playlist link in the video description. So welcome back to the series. We're now on John chapter 5. So this will be an interesting study because there's a few bits in John chapter 5 where it appears to be a little bit trickier or a bit different to what we've read so far. And if we don't understand it carefully and interpret it carefully, it, it may undermine some of the stuff that we were reading in John chapter 3 and 4. So we introduce this chapter with the story of the, the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. Now I'm going to read the first 13 verses, not because there's any doctrinal points that I need to pluck out of these verses, but because it's going to be very important to setting the context in verse 14. Okay, It's going to be very important just to understand what came before verse 14 so that we can interpret it correctly. So starting in verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool, and troubled the water, Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will you be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up your bed and walk. Then asked they of him, What man is that which said unto you, Take up your bed and walk? And he that was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. So, as I mentioned, no doctrinal points that I want to pluck out of these verses, but they're very important to set the context for what's coming next. So with that context in mind, it says in verse 14, Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, you are made whole. Sin no more, unless a worst thing should come upon you. So the statement, sin no more, is often used as a, a very quick remark to dispute salvation by faith alone, or that is to say, faith without works. Although they usually quote from uh, John 8's story of the woman caught in adultery, where it actually says, go and sin no more. So these are just a couple of uh, example comments from YouTube. Um, I've been kind enough to block out the, the names, but uh, people will say things like, go and sin no more. Sounds pretty clear to me. You know, easy believism is right up there with the deadly doctrine of, of once saved, always saved. And so they take that statement on its own, go and sin no more, and apply that to salvation, right? And these are just a couple of other examples of people doing the same thing. You know, go and sin no more. Makes sense. Jesus said, get up and sin no more. And then they just automatically say things like, sounds like they love their sin more than God, just by default of having a faith alone doctrine um, or whatever. So let me show you what the problem is with, with taking this statement, sin no more or go and sin no more, and applying that as an instruction for our salvation. Because up to now, we've been reading in John 3 and John 4, whoever believes, believe and have eternal life, whosoever believes, no mention of sin no more, no mention of turning from our sins to be saved, it's just believe. And now obviously these people will say, well, we have to use the whole Bible. Well, yes, but you have to use it in the right context as to what it's talking about. So the problem with taking this statement, sin no more, and, and turning that into an eternal life instruction, we'll see on the next slide, is that you were reading verses 1 to 13 there, presumably. I, I read them out. Salvation and eternal life was never mentioned in that passage. There is absolutely no proof from these first 13 verses that this man was saved before, during, or after he was healed, okay? So, when work salvation is justified from this passage, they only assume 
that salvation is implied in the context of sin no more, but it's not really proved, okay? And what you'll find is with, with work salvation and conditional security, and all the groups do this, whether it's the Catholics or the Seventh-day Adventists or Jehovah's Witnesses or whoever, they often rely on adding unprovable conjecture to passages, okay? Just because this man got healed, it doesn't necessarily mean that he was saved at the same time. Um, we will actually see an example of this later in John 9, um, when somebody gets healed but doesn't automatically know who the Christ is. And so, yes, we can say that healing is a picture of salvation, but it's not in of itself fundamental proof that people actually got saved, though. Okay, People could have been healed and potentially not saved, or they could have already been saved before they got healed. You can't just automatically equate the two. So we will, again, we'll see the similar story in John 8 with the woman caught in adultery, where, again, Jesus says, go and sin no more. They automatically take that as a salvation instruction, even though there's nothing in that story to, to bring out salvation in any way that eternal life was ever the context of Jesus' exchange. There's just no mention that he ever talked about that subject with that woman. So building on this point, then, that uh, eternal life is not given as the context of go and sin no more, we, we need to be able to interpret this verse. So Jesus advises him, sin no more, for what purpose? Because you might lose your salvation if you don't. Well, he doesn't say that. He just says, sin no more, unless a worst thing will come upon you. Okay. This does not necessarily or automatically mean hellfire. Okay. Jesus never mentions hellfire here, even though he has no problem mentioning it in other conversations, in other gospels. All right. It's just, it just doesn't mention it. He could have said, unless you be cast into hellfire, if that's the point that he wanted to get across. But he doesn't say it like that. He just says, unless a worse thing could come upon you. Okay. So just thinking about this logically, you can easily demonstrate that worse things can come upon him physically, such as, for example, he could be become blind and lame. So he just got healed from being lame. He could become lame all over again, and then he could be blind as well. Well, that would be worse. Okay. He could have he could be killed physically but not spiritually. So we just assume he gets killed physically, doesn't lose his salvation or anything. Possibly with an unpleasant death, like, for example, King Saul died falling upon his own sword, cut his life short. So, while ever he's lame, presumably he's not in a great deal of pain when he's actually lame, but obviously it's very frustrating to be lame. But then, you know, he could have a much more unpleasant outcome in that regard. Now, again, it's too early in the Bible to actually pull all of this out but if we understand the, the chastisement of believers it's perfectly plausible that the lame man was already saved prior to his encounter with jesus okay jesus never actually gave him the gospel as far as we could see he didn't say believe on me have eternal life he never mentioned that in the passage that we've read okay so jesus has to warn. if we assume that he's already a believer let's just say that he is for the sake of argument jesus then has to warn him being a believer that worse things could happen to him physically, even though his salvation isn't affected, because the Bible is clear. God chastens his sons. Hebrews 12. Okay. There are a lot of wicked people in the world who do wicked things and live to be, you know, in their 80s and, and die the natural way very peaceably. Okay. And then there's a lot of people who haven't done all those wicked things and they end up with a much worse life. Okay. But the Bible is clear that God does chasten his children. Okay. It doesn't say chastens the people of the world. Now, even though hell, even if hell were the context, okay, technically he could say sin no more. But then what if, let's say, this man was to die without Christ? Let's just say that he wasn't actually a believer, okay? It is absolutely true that this worst thing then could come upon him anyway, because even if he did never sin again, but he dies without Christ, well, then this warning of, of lesser worse thing, well, that's going to come upon him anyway if he dies without Christ, Okay. Christ never instructed the layman to believe on him. There is no gospel instruction evident in this passage at all. Okay. So just as we saw with the issue of go and sin no more being related to salvation, this would be totally con conjectural. We, we obviously don't want to make assumptions about this passage. So you might flip it back on me and say, well, I can't prove that this is exactly what Jesus meant. But all I'm trying to show you is that there are other ways of looking at it. Okay, there's other ways of interpreting it. The, the key point here is that there is absolutely no proof that sinning no more unless a worse thing coming upon you is in any way related to a warning about losing salvation and being thrown into hell. You have to inject that into the context because you want to prove your doctrine 
if that's what you want to interpret it as. Okay, so you've got a doctrine, you wanted to prove it, so you're just going to make the text say that with no real proof surrounding that, that that's what it actually means. Okay, so obviously we've only looked at the first 13 verses. We've only looked at what came before verse 14. But then what about the verses that came after verse 14? Because after verse 14, in the rest of John 5, Jesus is actually going to talk about eternal life. He is going to talk about believing on him in the same chapter. So then you might wonder, well, okay, maybe it is the context of sin no more. It's just that it's the verses that come after it rather than verses before it. Well, the verse that comes after verse 14 will disprove that. So let me show you. So in verse 15, it says, The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. So notice the lame man has departed. He's no longer present or relevant to the dialogue that Jesus is going to have in the upcoming verses. Okay, Jesus said, go and sin no more to the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And now he's departed. In the next verses, you're going to see that Jesus is now talking to the Jews. And it's the Jews that this, this man told. So Jesus doesn't say, go and sin no more to this crowd of Jews. He said it to the lame man. He's departed. So when he starts talking about eternal life in the upcoming verses, they are not the context of go and sin no more. OK, those two things are not connected, even though the chapter hasn't changed. Or someone else has just decided to chap number the chapters in however they will. But the context has changed partway through the chapter. OK, so and it, you'll find advocates of a works based salvation or salvation that incorporates works or loss of salvation in some way. They constantly do this the catholics do this the seventh day adventists do this the jehovah's witnesses do this the mormons do this even protestants and evangelicals can do this where they'll they'll take a statement out of the bible and they'll apply it to it an eternal life instruction when it simply is not okay or what they do is that the passage says something and they will add this conjecture or embellish what the statement actually says to make it say something that it does not actually say once again, because they just want to prove their doctrine and they just want to pull these verses out without actually looking more holistically at the Bible by comparing scripture with scripture. So let me show you a few examples of, of how they actually do this. So, for example, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 26, it says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. So they take that statement, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. They then interpret this verse as actually saying, if we sin, excuse me, after we are saved, Jesus' sacrifice will no longer be effective for us. And so we have to repent of our sins and go through that whole process all over again. But it doesn't actually say that his sacrifice will no longer be effective. It says there remains no more sacrifices for sins. And if you just look at the verses that came before it, and it talked about the Old Testament sacrifices, it's clear Jesus has now been sacrificed. There is no continual sacrifices required anymore. That's what it says. That's the context of it. But they read it completely differently. Uh, you have uh, statements like in James 2.20, it says, But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Well, a lot of people, that, that's one of the favourite go-to verses for everybody that has a, a work salvation. And they'll say things like, well, there's no such thing as faith, faith without works. And this here is the proof text. But if faith without works didn't exist the statement faith without works is dead would be a meaningless statement it would make no sense because for something to be dead it had to have existed and been alive you know if there's a dead dog in the road you can't say the dog doesn't exist then there's a dead dog in the road okay it does exist but it was once alive and is now dead okay romans 6 1 and 2 it says uh, what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound god forbid how shall we, that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? So when it says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul is obviously asking a hypothetical question there, and then he answers his own question. But they'll read that as saying, if you carry on sinning after you are saved, you forfeit God's grace, or you, you've walked away from, from God's grace. But that would, that would mean that Paul's hypothetical question then is a stupid question. Because if he said, well, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, grace doesn't abound when we sin. So it's a, it's a daft question. Okay. The thing is, grace does abound because sin abounds. But that's still not an excuse to carry on living in sin. That's his point, which we'll, we'll see when we actually do a study of Romans. But that's the point that Paul's actually making. To interpret it the way that people often interpret it just means that Paul's question makes no sense. There's no reason why he would even raise that hypothetical question. Okay. He asks that hypothetical question because he's got to answer it. Okay. 
Uh, 1 John 3.15, uh, this statement says, For whosoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has life abiding in him. So people will ask this stupid hypothetical thing, or they'll, they'll raise this hypothetical point of, well, then a born-again Christian could go out and murder a load of school children. Okay, so they you can't clearly say that they're saved if they go out and do that because no murderer has life abiding in him. But the thing is, the people who say this, and they'll point to people like me who are faith alone and, and eternal security, and they'll point to us and say, well, you could just go out and kill a bunch of people and you'll still be saved. But the thing is, they can provide no real-life examples of a hypothetical born-again person who go, goes out and does a bunch of those things, okay? I, I've i never advocated doing that. I don't know of a born-again person who's done that. And if someone says to me that I could go out and do that, and so we must not be able to believe in faith alone, or we cannot have eternal security because it, it just gives me an excuse to go out and kill people and still let me see. Well, really, it reveals more about what's in their heart than what's in my heart because I don't want I don't understand why a born again person would want to go around killing a bunch of people okay I can understand why an unsaved person would want to go out and do that so when they come up with that hypothetical and they object to faith alone because we could just go out and kill people well it, that to me just tells me that that's what they would go and do if they thought they could get away with it so you know or, or they'll interpret it as saying well you know no murderer has eternal life abiding in him but I'm not a murderer, so, you know, I get a free pass on my sins, because at least I'm not a murderer, according to the standard of 1 John 3.15. And it just goes to show you how foolish it is when they just take these things and, and just read something that it, it just doesn't say, okay? And then the last example that I've given is in, in later in John's Gospel, in 14.5, Jesus will say to his disciples, If you love me, keep my commandments, okay? And again... That people, if, if I believe that faith is alone or I believe in eternal security, they will, they will accuse me of saying that we can disobey Christ's commandments and go around sinning. Okay. Even though they can't ever quote me as ever actually saying that. Okay. I've never said, let's go out and sin. Let's go out and party. I've never said that, but I will be automatically accused of saying that by virtue of being faith alone or by virtue of proclaiming eternal security. And, and you try and explain to these people about the chastisement of believers, that how God actually deals with the sins of believers. You try and show them where Paul says, if I sin, it's no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells in my flesh. And, and, and you just try and explain this to them. And all you get is, like, does not compute, repeat previous rhetoric. And, and it's just, it's so frustrating because the Bible's really clear about that. You know, it's really clear about what happens if you don't obey his commandments. But but they just take this statement, if you love me, keep my, and they just make this big doctrine about work salvation but again salvation is never implied as a context which we'll actually see when we do a study of john 14 so you know they, they do this same thing in, in john's gospel over and over again john's gospel is saying believe have eternal life believe have eternal life believe have eternal life and, and when it says that it's predominantly jesus talking to unsaved people that need to believe on him and get saved all right but then they take these statements like sin no more or if you love me keep my commandments and they make that an eternal life instruction even though that is never mentioned as the context of this phrase jesus never mentioned eternal life to the man at the pool of bethesda he never mentioned it to the woman caught in adultery he never insisted that they need to believe on him and get saved and when he says if you love me keep my commandments he's talking to his disciples it's a very intimate conversation with his choice disciples and again, he never mentions eternal life to them because he or they already have eternal life. They already believe on him. Okay. So yeah, I'm sorry for kind of digressing. I know we need to stick to John 5. You know, I had to get off my chest. Now, you know, should we go and sin no more? Well, yes, absolutely. I believe that we should. If you are in bondage to sin, you need to be out of bondage because as Jesus said, unless a worse thing could come upon you. But the thing is that that doesn't have to mean hellfire. It doesn't have to mean losing salvation because you don't have to be a spiritually minded person to understand that. You see, I don't want to spend the rest of my life or, or 37 or 30, however many years of my life with no working legs sat by a pool like the man at the pool of Bethesda. OK, I don't want God to cause me or allow me to have a debilitating accident where I end up in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Okay, Now I'm in my 30s, my early 30s. I don't want to then be blind or maim or lame for another 50 years of my life okay so that for me is a good enough reason in and of itself to keep his commandments and go and sin no more 
that that's just a good enough reason in of itself, even if I'm going to heaven anyway, okay? Because, you know, do you really want to spend 50 years of your life lame or blind? Well, nobody does, okay? And so the point is, you see, there's two ways that you could end your life. You could end your life like Saul and fall upon your own sword, okay? Or you can be like Paul and say, I fought the good fight, okay? You, again, perfectly good enough reason to sin no more and obey Christ's commandments, even if you are going to heaven anyway, okay? But regarding my salvation, I have a promise from Jesus. He said that he is the shepherd. He holds on to his sheep, which, which is something that we'll see later in John chapter 10, later in the series. It's a beautiful chapter, okay? We have those promises that Christ will hold on to us, okay? So, you know, it, it just goes to show that the foolishness of people that just take this well jesus said go and sin no more our salvation must depend on it, it makes perfect sense to me and, and they just don't grasp the irony of which they they say these statements okay so so whenever we get these statements like this we need to look at what's the surrounding context is it even talking about what we think it's talking about is there enough clear information to build such a doctrine around this statement okay and What's the audience that Jesus is talking to? And as this series progresses and I start doing more studies on John in, in some of the more difficult chapters later, like 14, 15, uh, we, we can start to actually pluck some of this out and we can give you more tools to actually how to divide the word of God um, and, and how, what, what, how to build our doctrine around the appropriate verses. So that's all I'm sort of going to say about that. But there's a little bit more that I do need to cover about go and sin no more. So then an objection that people will uh, throw then is that what they might say is something like Jesus wouldn't have told the man to sin no more if it was not possible. So this must mean it is literally possible to, to sin no more. Otherwise, you know, why is Jesus saying that? And, and that's an important question. You know, we need to be be able to be proven with hard questions and answer a question like that because it, it is a good and, and fundamentally important question. So I'm not going to spend too long on this point because I don't want to digress too far from John 5, but we will we will briefly look at it because it, it has to be dealt with. And, and when we do future studies on other more relevant passages, we, we can unpack that a lot more. Okay, But the problem with that question on of its own is to take a very isolated view of the Bible because you, ha you have to take a statement like this on its own with no real surrounding salient context or information. You see, we don't know what underlying sins the man at the pool actually had that caused his infirmity if any okay we, we don't have that information so you're arguing arguing from silence we also don't know what kind of life he lived after jesus said this to him we don't know whether he did literally sin no more we don't know if he just he didn't do any major sins but he did stumble as human beings do we just don't know that about him we have nothing to go on okay you also have to take one or two isolated short statements like this at the expense of plenty of other clear and more detailed passages which we will i intend to cover later in the series so there are plenty of scriptures that deal with the issue of a believer that sins there are plenty of scriptures that deal with the chastisement of believers and jesus clearly dealt with the issue of forgiveness the need for god to forgive us and the need to forgive one another which would be completely redundant if we didn't sin so you can't just take this statement on its own and then just pretend that the rest of the Bible doesn't exist and put your fingers in your ears. We, we need to be able to bring those two things together. Whenever you appear to get a contradiction, we need to be able to bring those two things together. So let's let's compare the, the two opposing sides that we've got in, in Scripture. So why would Jesus say, sin no more, when he could have said something along the lines of, well, try and stop sinning or, you know, try and do better next time, and, unless it is truly possible, okay? Well, on the one hand, we have verses that deal with God's mercy on our sins as believers. Now, I've not provided any direct quotes here. I'm sort of paraphrasing, but the verses are there if you want to look them up. So, you know, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us, Lord, our daily bread, okay, daily needs, and forgive us our sins, okay, clearly asking for forgiveness, which again, if we didn't sin, what do we need forgiven from? If you forgive other men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you, forgive yours. And that's uh, Matthew 6.14 there. Okay. It says, forgive anything you have against anybody when you pray so that your heaven, Father in heaven may forgive your trespasses. That's in Mark 11.25. Compassion and forgiveness belongs to the Lord, for we have rebelled against him. Okay. That's Daniel 9.9. .9. 
Uh, be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving towards one another, even at, for, as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That's Ephesians 4.32. Now look at this. This is an interesting verse. But there is forgiveness with God that he may be feared. Okay, that's Psalm 134. That, that's a very interesting verse because actually it's saying here the purpose of the forgiveness of God is that he may be feared. It's not that, well, he must be, be feared in spite of his forgiveness. He may be feared because of his forgiveness, because there is forgiveness with God. Very, very interesting uh, passage there. We have redemption through Christ's blood in him, forgiveness of our trespasses according to, what is it, according to us turning from our sins? No, it's according to the riches of God's grace. That's Ephesians 1, 7. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's 1 John 2, 1 there. So we have all these verses that deal with God's mercy on our sins as believers. Okay, but then contrast that with all these verses that talk about striving against sin and, and overcoming it. So this same passage, the same verse that I've used there, 1 John 2, 1, the same verse also says, these things I write unto you, or John writes unto you, that you do not sin. That's the purpose of him writing that. Okay, at the same time as saying that if we sin, we have an advocate. Um, it says in Galatians 5, 16, if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh there. Um, the Lord chastens those he loves and scourges every son who he receives. Okay, that's Hebrews 12.6. Um, shall we sin because we are under grace, not under the law? God forbid. That's Galatians 6.15. Very similar to how he writes in Romans that, you know, shall we sin that grace may abound? Well, well God forbid. Um, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. That's Romans 8.13. And then later in that same chapter, he'll go on to say, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Um, and, and the context is about uh, sin there and, and walking in the spirit. Um, he that abides in Christ ought to walk as Christ walked. That's in 1 John 1, 6. And then uh, later in John's same letter, he'll say in chapter 3, verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for God's seed remains in him. And he cannot sin. It's quite a strong statement there, because he is born of God. So on the one hand, we have all these verses about forgiving our sins. And some of that implies that there's actually an ongoing need for that. And then we have these verses about striving against sin and how, you know, he who is born of God does not sin. OK, so we can't just take all of that and then pretend that that doesn't exist or it only refers to the past sins, you know, because you'd have to add conjecture really to, to come to that conclusion. And it undermines actually what some of it says. But you can't just take some of this and then just pretend that the, the Bible never says any of this either. And so bringing this all together, we, so we have sins about, we, we have all the verses about past and, and ongoing forgiveness. OK, and then we have verses about sinning and mortifying fleshly desires. So understanding the flesh and the spirit here and the distinction between the two will actually help this to make more sense, which will become more apparent when, we, when we're studying Romans 6 to 8. But we still need to answer, well, why does Jesus say sin no more when he could have phrased it as try and stop sinning, perhaps? But there's a very good reason for this, OK, because bringing these two sets of verses together, we, we don't want to have a defeatist attitude towards sin because, you know, people can have a defeatist attitude and say, well, we're always going to sin. So no point in trying not to, or, you know, well, we'll just bear our cross or, or you know, however they'll say it. But the thing is, is that the very thing that separates the saved from the unsaved, besides being saved in the first place, not not just in itself, but it's the fact that we now have a born again spirit to wrestle against the flesh. OK, which the unsaved man, he does not have that. He either doesn't wrestle against his flesh at all and just carries on living in sin, or he tries to wrestle against flesh with flesh. And that's trying to be justified by the law, ultimately. So, yes, we absolutely should strive to sin no more by putting on the new man and walking in the spirit. Nevertheless, despite this fact, or, you know, even still considering this fact, we still need to acknowledge our ongoing need for Christ's forgiveness and our unredeemed flesh. OK, now I haven't referenced the verses here, but it will become um, apparent later in the study of the New Testament, is that our new body is a future resurrection. OK, the current body is still mortal. It's still a condemned vessel. This flesh is unredeemable. OK. It does not catch up with the new man that, that you have in the spirit. Okay, Christ still instructed us to pray for forgiveness 
Okay. So if you're going to come up with a doctrine that says a true believer will never sin or never sin again, well, then you, why did Christ tell us to ask for forgiveness then? That, that's a completely redundant statement. And he said it in the Lord's Prayer, which says, give us our daily bread. Okay, that's a daily need. All right, so bringing the two things together, there's a continual need to ask for Christ's forgiveness. And some people will say things like, well, all sin is willful, because there's this thing in Hebrews 10 where it talks about if we sin willfully, this happens and so on. And so people say, well, all sin is willful. But the thing is, actually, willful sins aren't, are just one category of sin. There are other categories of sin, such as, for example, the sins of ignorance, which you might call the unknown sins. And the Bible even says, actually, the thought of foolishness is sin. That's in Proverbs 24. So, you know, you would wonder whether these high and mighty sinless perfectionists would claim to never, ever have a foolish thought, because even having foolish thought is sin, according to the Bible. And what the point that God's trying to get across to you here is that there is a standard of righteousness that you cannot attain, okay? Only Jesus attained that standard, okay? You've got to believe in him to have his righteousness imputed onto you. It doesn't say you become this super, uber righteous Christian that just never sins again. It, it's Christ's righteousness imputed onto you, okay? His righteousness is given to you. That's all I can really say about it, you know, from here, but that will become more apparent as we study uh, more things in the Bible. Remember that John is keeping things fairly simple here, and he's also telling some of the stories of Jesus, okay? So not all of them are doctrinal statements about salvation. So uh, let's just move on. So I've spent more than half an hour dealing with one verse, but let's just go back to John chapter fi uh, 5 and continue where we left off. So in verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father works up until now, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So the context has now changed. We, we already explained that earlier. Jesus is now talking to the Jews. He's not talking to the man at the pool. So um, some do wonder what the meaning is of Jesus defending working on the Sabbath. And they do wonder, well, does that mean that he broke the law by violating the Sabbath? Well, it's not really clear enough from this passage alone. You, you really need a greater understanding of salvation doctrine across the Bible to sort of understand this. But when we understand a more overall picture is that the Sabbath is actually a picture of salvation. Okay. And the reason is, is because if we understand that it's not by our works, it's by faith that we're saved. It's because Jesus did the work. It's his righteousness imputed onto us. So he did the work for salvation, whereas we rest. And so salvation is rest and salvation is a picture of that. So with this greater understanding, it's perfectly reasonable that Jesus worked on the Sabbath day while everybody else rested. OK, and likewise, he did the work on the cross during the Passover when everyone else was resting. OK, so in the overall picture of salvation, he works for our salvation. We do not, because salvation is by grace through faith in his works, not in our works. Why? Because no man can boast. OK, only Christ can do the works necessary to earn our salvation. We cannot, okay? So that's just something when you have a greater understanding, it makes perfectly sen perfect sense why he works on the Sabbath, because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He does the work for our salvation, but we rest in his work, okay? That's why they rested on the Sabbath day while he worked, okay? And carrying on in verse 9, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself, but what he sees, the Father does. For what things soever he does, these also does the Son likewise. For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead, and quickens them, even so the, the Son quickens whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honour the Son, even as they honour the Father. He that honours not the Son, honours not the Father which has sent him. So, there's nothing here to address in terms of um, salvation per se. Uh, obviously, it does apply to our salvation in the wider context in terms of the relationship between the Son and the Father and the deity of Christ. But this series is not really meant to address theology and the Trinity and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not actually going to delve into that. Um, it's related to our salvation, but it, there's no salvation instruction as to, to what to do to be saved. So um, I'm, I'm not really going to cover any more about that. And then a crucial verse, verse 24, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that hears my word 
and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And so this verifies what was said um, a few verses ago, this relationship between the Son and the Father. Now, earlier in John's Gospel, we were told to believe on the Son, okay? Believe on his only begotten Son, that you may have everlasting life. But now Jesus is telling us, believe on him that sent me. Well, that's the Father, okay? So earlier we said, believe on the Son for everlasting life. Now he's saying, believe on the Father. So these are interchangeable. You can't have one without the other, okay? We're also seeing more of these very definite, clear statements here. Notice it says, has, present tense, everlasting life. It's not, well, he might have, he could have, maybe. You have everlasting life, okay? Very definite statement there. It also says, shall not, future tense, come into condemnation. So again, it doesn't say, well, might not, may not, you know, whatever it is. Shall not, okay? And then John, uh, bearing in mind, John 3.18 said in our earlier study, is not condemned present tense. So we see there's no present tense condemnation and there's no future tense condemnation. Okay. Is present tense past perfect tense at present from death onto life. Okay. Has already passed and is now onto life, not death. Okay. There is no evidence, by the way, from this passage that passing from death onto life is in any way reversible. Okay. Now, yes, there are other passages that deal with falling away, departing from the faith, which we will have to deal with later in the series as we get to those passages. We can't just put our fingers in our ears and pretend that it doesn't say that. But there is no proof, okay, that a born-again spirit can reverse into death. And people with conditional security, if they get very doctrinal about it, they'll come up with a doctrine about how the spirit can still die. Um, so you can be born again in spirit, but then you die and then you have to be born again or all over again. And so there is no proof that the spirit can die. Okay. So let, let's pick up on that point and let, let's compare eternal security versus conditional security in light of this verse, just to try and prove what, what, what Jesus is showing us here. And, and if we can understand this, if we can understand how to rightly divide the difference between eternal security and conditional security and which one actually fits with the Bible, we can then properly interpret the verses that warn about falling away from the faith and departing and, 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 and so on. Okay. So picking up then on this point, passed from death onto life, we have eternal security, also known as once saved, always saved. And then we have conditional security where we can lose our salvation. Now, I did already explain this distinction in my study of John 4, when we looked at taking, Jesus described taking the water of eternal life, okay, this everlasting uh, life equated with drinking a glass of water. So we looked at that, we kept it fairly simple. The more we read John, the more advanced scriptures we get and the more we can build on this same point, okay, because we have more scriptures now to, to verify what we're saying. And so under the eternal security model, so a man believes on Christ, he's born again, and, and he cannot lose his salvation no matter what he does, okay? Well, then, as per all the scriptures in the Bible, we can say that this man is elect, predestined, sealed onto the day of redemption. But we can also say for sure that this man shall not come into condemnation and is passed from death unto life. We, we can say that for sure about this man in light of the verse in John 5 that we've just read. Okay. Under the conditional security model, that's where we can lose our salvation. Well, a man believes, gets born again. But then he sins or he walks away or whatever happens and he loses his salvation again. So then he has to believe all over again and get born again again. Okay. But then he could sin again or he could lose his faith again and he could lose his salvation again. And then he has to go through that whole process of being born again, again, again. Now, if God's graceful to him, or I don't like using this word, but if he's lucky, you might say he might die here. He might die in his saved condition. But he could also die here. He could die in his unsaved condition or his unsaved state. Okay. Well, we cannot say the same about this man. He might be condemned if he's unlucky. Or he might die in his safe state if he's lucky. It, it, it comes down to pure chance, really, because you don't know what state he's going to die in. Okay. He could die here, but then he could die. We, we cannot say for sure. We can't say that he is passed from death onto life. Because he could, he could reverse into death again. And that might be the condition where he actually dies in. And that's where he spends eternity in, in condemnation. We don't know for sure that he's going to spend eternity in eternal life under this model. Okay. Now, one of the objections that the conditional security advocates often point to man's free will. And they'll say, well, because man has free will, 
he can walk away from his salvation. Okay. There's a lot of problems with this because, first of all, they have no proof text where, because of man's free will, he can lose his salvation by choice. There's, there's no proof text that says that. They have to conjecture that by pulling some verses that talk about free will and then injecting it into passages about salvation like John 5.24 that never actually mention that free will has anything to do with it whatsoever. It also actually ignores the fact that some decisions are actually permanent, okay? You know, if you commit suicide, you can't say, oh, well, free will, God will let me back in and have another... You can't say that because some decisions are permanent, okay? We will explore this uh, more throughout uh, this, this particular study. So let's just say, okay, a man has free will, but at the same time, we can also say that God has appointed our days. There are scriptures that say that God knows the, the days of our life. He knows our days are numbered. And he sealed us onto the day of redemption. So then it has to, if God sealed us from the day of redemption, until the day of redemption, sorry, it then begs the question, why God would allow him to die in his unsafe state? Because if God knows when this guy's going to die, he knows whether he's going to die here or here. Remember, God already knows this. And even conditional security advocates have to admit that God knows everything. Okay, you can't deny that without being blasphemous. Well, if God knows that this guy could have gone off a cliff and lost his salvation, well, God co could cause you know, him to have had an accident or allowed him to have some sort of accident or debilitating illness, which could have caused him to die here, just so that then at least God could say, well, he is sealed onto the day of redemption, because I know when he's going to die, so I'll just make sure that he dies in his safe state. Now, then they'll throw it back and say, yeah, but man can choose, though. He, he has free will. Yeah, but then at one point he already chose this here. He already chose life here. He already chose life here. So God could still make sure he died in this safe condition, but it was still man's choice. And and this is the problem. It, it just completely ignores the fact under this model that God knows all things. Okay, God knows whether you're going to have eternal life or not. So this is the problem with this model. It just acts like God is just letting us, and it's all by chance, by the way, whether you'll die here or here. Like, you could be hit by a bus here. Maybe you'll die peacefully here. You just don't know. It, it comes down to pure chance. OK, ultimately, and it, it, it's just not biblical in, in the whole scope of things. Now, we haven't really unpacked a lot from John to necessarily prove this point. It will only be proven stronger when we get to John chapter six and John chapter 10. So, you know, just keep keep coming with me. Keep keep bearing in mind this. But with this in mind, though, um, picking up on this earlier point that when we looked at the issue of sin no more, people that advocate conditional security, they will object to eternal security and they'll object to faith alone because in their view, it allows believers to carry on sinning and still make it to heaven. Okay, un un th that's their opinion. It, well, it, we can't allow eternal security and faith alone because it just means you can sin as much as you want and still make it to heaven, right? The, and so that, that's, that's why they cling on to conditional security. But the problem with this view is that conditional security, it doesn't actually absolve people of being able to sin as much as they want, which which I'll show in the next slide. So, you know, they'll make these statements from which they find from the Bible, where it says, you know, you must endure to the end to be saved. You must abide in him. You must have works fruit to show your faith. So let me prove to you the faulty logic of this assertion. OK, so let's look at then the faulty logic of conditional security. So under this model, both of these guys can can lose their salvation. OK, they're just people that take slightly different paths in their life. So this guy gets born again, he gets saved, he spends his whole life living for God and continues to abide in Christ. But then in the last few hours of his life, he has some unfortunate circumstances, you know, financial trouble, family trouble, whatever, it all gets a bit much for him. He ends up drinking and then stupidly, because he's drunk, he ends up driving as well. So he drink drives. He then loses his salvation, but then because he's drink driving, he dies in a car crash instantly. He doesn't have chance to repent at all. OK, he just doesn't have that chance because it was such a quick death. And yet somehow, even though he spent his whole life living for God, spent his whole life enduring one moment of madness, doesn't even get chance to repent. And somehow he falls under the category of depart from me. I never knew you. OK, this guy down here, he spends his whole life rejecting God and living in sin. But then in the last moment of his life, he's hospitalised. Uh, you know, he's in hospital, he's ill, he knows he's going to die. So during that time, he repents of all his sins, believes in Christ and gets saved. And somehow he falls under the category of, well done, my good and faithful servant. He that endures to the end shall be saved. So this really in of itself ought to explain to you 
the rather ridiculous logic of conditional security of saying that eternal security somehow absolves people of sin. Okay. Now, this issue where this guy could repent at the last minute of his life, um, obviously salvation is undeserved. Okay. So, yeah, there's there's no reason why if if somebody repented at the last minute of their life, there's no reason why they couldn't be saved above anybody else that that lived a whole life, you know, be, being a faithful servant. So, you know, he doesn't deserve to be saved any more or less than I do or anybody else does. Now, there are scriptures that deal with um, man hardening his heart and going down a kind of reprobate path where it becomes so evil and so reprobate where he's never going to be saved. He will he will never believe. He, he won't even have this last minute chance to repent. However, in my experience, most people who believe in conditional security don't agree with that doctrine. They believe that man can repent up until his dying breath. And, and in fact, even eternal security advocates believe that sometimes. It's a bit ridiculous, really. But the thing is, a lot of people who say you can lose your salvation, they still believe that a man can repent in the last moment of his life. So this guy could still go through this entire journey of rejecting God, living in sin, but then he just decides to repent at the last minute and then somehow he endured to the end to be saved. But but this guy who lived the life, had fruits meet for repentance, he loses it all just because of, of one mess up, basically, regardless of what actually happened through this period in his life. And, and this ought to really show you the faulty logic of work salvation, the faulty logic of conditional security. Okay, but as you can see, conditional security doesn't deal with this problem. They object to eternal security and faith alone because, well, you could just sin as much as you want and still be saved. Well, so can this guy under their model. Okay, this is what's so stupid about this worldview. It, it doesn't absolve people from sin because they can still sin and then just repent and get their salvation back anyway. Okay. Um, and again, in our study of John 3, we briefly looked at the issue of being born again. Um, it is too early in the series to really expound on that yet, because I've not got the right verses from, from John to be able to deal with it. But really, the burden is on conditional security advocates to explain why, if a born-again person cannot continue in sin, okay, why he, he's a born-again person, he's a new creature, according to the Bible. So why, even if we have free will, okay, let's just say that we have free will, we can choose to lose our salvation, but why would a born-again person who's a new creature in Christ ever choose to walk away from salvation? Like, if you knew what eternal life was, why would you ever walk away from it? And, and Jesus Christ sort of touched upon this with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. If you knew the gift of God, okay, if you knew it, you would have asked for it, you know. Um, we will actually see this in um, John chapter 6, actually, in terms of why would a born-again person ever walk away from eternal life? I'll, I'll show that in, in the next study. But why would a born-again person who's a new creature ever choose to forfeit salvation? But again, this is the problem. People who advocate conditional security, they don't understand the flesh between... They don't understand the distinction between the flesh and the spirit but they also don't understand the distinction between the chastisement of believers. Okay, we'll park that issue for now. Um, we'll, we'll deal with that when we get to the scriptures that deal with that, particularly in, in Romans. Um, it's too early to explore it, explore it just yet. Um, but in conclusion, conditional security does not absolve people from being able to sin as much as they want, because those who don't sin can just as easily lose their salvation at any moment, in one moment of madness, really. Um, many advocates also believe that someone can repent at any moment of their life. So under this assertion, someone can still live a life full of sin anyway and just repent at the last minute. That They don't always believe in the, the hardening of hearts. They, they reject that doctrine sometimes. So that, that really ought to show you that they defeat their own logic. And it, it's just, think about this, it's ludicrous to think that someone who's lived this life for Christ, who clearly loves Christ, who clearly believes... He could die. We, we don't know how he's going to end his life. He could easily die in an accident. And these conditional ex security advocates expect him, you know, God forgive me. Like, you know, just in two seconds, he's supposed to just repent in sackcloth and ashes in the two seconds he has to think before he dies in a car crash. And the thing is as well is what about people with Alzheimer's? Okay. Someone who is in their eighties and starts losing their mind. Do you think they're going to go on living for God while they have Alzheimer's? Now, if you were to confront somebody with conditional security uh, beliefs, well, what about that person? And they'll say, well, yeah, of course God's going to have mercy on that person because of their unique situation. But the thing is, what scripture can you base that on? Where can you show me that God has some special exemption 
for unique situations. And, and you know, you, you throw things at them, like you, you try and point to the thief on the cross as an example for per, someone who died without works. Well, that's a, that's a one-off situation. Like they make special exceptions for their carnal mind because they think that God should grant them an exception because they would grant them an exception, right? But the thing is, under the eternal security model, we have those promises. God promised you are passed from death onto life. God promised Jesus, I will never let them be plucked out of my hand. God promised they shall not come into condemnation. Under conditional security, you don't really have that promise. Okay. So you can't say to me that someone with Alzheimer's won't lose their salvation again because you've got no promise for that. You make it all about man and him keeping himself. You don't make it about God keeping people. And so this will become more apparent through the study. I'm not I'm not going to kind of dwell on that point anymore here, but it, it really should just show you that the absolute ludicrousness of this doctrine and how it just doesn't fit in the Bible at all, okay? It's just completely contradictory to everything that Jesus has been telling us. Now, once we understand this more, and we will understand it more in our study of John, we can then rightly interpret the verses that deal with falling away and departing from the faith. We can understand those, once we can understand this point. Okay, so for now, let, let's get back to the study of John 5. So continuing then in uh, John chapter 5, verse 25, Truly, truly, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. So then this statement here in, in 29, those who have done good, versus those who have done evil. You can understand how this could easily be misused to teach a works salvation, because now the conditions for the resurrection of life, which is an aspect of our eternal life, it's no, it's no longer whosoever believes, but rather it's who has done good, quote unquote. Now, if we were to assert that done good means those who have done good works, not only does that undermine everything that we've been reading so far in chapters 3 through 5, but it, it does not address these contradictions because what about believers who have done evil what about unbelievers who have done good and really there's not enough surrounding context for you to just automatically decide that that automatically means works unless you just just decided that you want it to mean that okay now this verse does have specific context notice it doesn't use the more generic terms of eternal life and condemnation Rather, it uses something more specific, the resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. So the resurrection of life is part of eternal life, but it is more specific. OK, so we need to define what it means to have done good versus done e done e doing evil, done evil, understanding that the context is the resurrection of life or the resurrection of damnation rather than just generally eternal life or, or uh, condemnation generally. So we need to have an understanding of how the resurrection fits into the plan of eternal life. OK, so let's look at how the resurrection fits into eternal life. Now, we haven't really progressed enough into the study to show this in great detail from the scriptures. And really, this is almost a, a separate study in its own right, really, because uh, although we, we did see in John chapter three that eternal life, the kingdom of God and heaven were used interchangeably in that chapter. So they were quite interchangeable terms there. A lot of Christians, if they don't know a lot about the Bible, or they don't, they don't really know that much about Christianity, they just assume, well, you die, you go to heaven, and that, that's kind of the end of the story. But it's not really, because even eternal life is broken down into, into several stages. And so I'm not going to go to great lengths to prove this just because it's not the focus of my study my study is more about how to be saved and get eternal life and keep it not so much about uh, what it's actually going to be like when we, when we get there so the current stage is that the dead in christ are resting in heaven only in soul okay the body is dead but but they are asleep they're they're resting um passages like for example paul touches about about this on first thessalonians 4 between 13 and 15 
Um, he, he advises the Thessalonians about what's going on regarding those that are asleep, which is euphemistic for those who have died. Okay. And then he, but uh, in those verses, he'll start to point them towards their future resurrection hope, which will be clarified here. So you've also got uh, like Luke 16, it talks about um, a beggar that was covered in sores and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Um, and then uh, Jesus said in Luke 23, 43 to the thief on the cross, um, you shall be with me in paradise. Um, so the, the, there's a few things there about resting um, there in a place of peace. Um, the, the, this uh, Luke 16 does seem to imply that there is some sort of consciousness going on there. That's something that people do argue about. But they're resting. Okay, they're dead in Christ, but they are resting with Christ. Okay, and and they're awaiting the next stage. Now, Revelation 7 and 14 also do give glimpses of happenings in heaven prior to the resurrection but they're a very different story because they don't really deal so much with rest they deal more to, towards worship and singing before the throne of god um but as i say we, we'll maybe cover those passages later when we do get to them but it, it's too early at this stage to really bring that out so then what we're looking for and in, in thessalonians paul will bring this up he'll, he'll carry on this thought into this thought that we're actually looking forward to a future resurrection this will tie up with when christ comes back Okay, so this is the first resurrection, and it's it's the millennial reign of Christ. So you have uh, like Thessalonians sixteen seventeen that the Lord will descend with a shout. Though uh, we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's those who are sleeping. Okay, and then we shall be ever with the Lord. And then you've got one Corinthians fifteen deals with um, the resurrection of Christ and um, how we will be made alive, but it's still a future issue. Okay. Um, and then Revelation 20, um, blessed in the holy sea that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. And so the resurrection will tie in with a millennial reign of Christ there. And then the final stage, as you keep working your way through Revelation into the final chapters, is that there is a new heaven and a new earth. Um, there's also between these two. So between these stages is actually where the resurrection of life um, takes place. So we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. So, so that's the essentially the three stages of, of eternity there, and this is all wrapped up in what the Bible calls the, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, because it says in Daniel that it's an it's an everlasting kingdom. Okay, it doesn't just take place periodically; it's an everlasting kingdom. It goes on forever. Okay, and then also even while Jesus was on the earth, um, you know, it said in Matthew eleven twelve, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violence takes it by force. Um, so, well, until so, what does he mean? And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Well, what did John the Baptist start? He started baptizing for the remission of sins. Why does the ki why does the kingdom suffer violence? Well, because John Christ and believers have, have been persecuted. Okay, so again, I am obviously super summarizing it there very very briefly. Um, so I'm sorry that I've rushed this. On. I'm sure some viewers would probably want a more deeper delve in, into this stuff. Really, um, some of you you may disagree with my view on the end times, or you may disagree with me about Abraham's bosom referring to heaven. Uh, but again, th this study series is more about how to get eternal life and uh, keeping it. But it's not really about what it's like when we get there. So I'm not I'm not really going to go any any further than that now. So before we tap into the uh, resurrection, let's just briefly go back to, to John 5.29. So earlier in John's Gospel, bear in mind Jesus described two types of people. There are those that believe versus those that don't believe. Okay, There are those that have eternal life and there are those that are condemned already. Okay, So Jesus is still describing two types of people here. It's just that they're described in a different way. There's those that have done good versus those that have done evil. So we need some context as to what it means to have done good or done evil. So um, advocates of conditional security and faithless works, obviously, they would define it as those who have done good works uh, versus those who have done evil works. But the problem with this is that, A, it would go against the surrounding context of John's Gospel, where the two options thus far have been those that believe versus those that don't believe. Okay, So to change the context for this verse alone is really to move the goalpost and invent an arbitrary link to work salvation. They also have to invent these hypothetical types of people and then lump them into one of the above categories. So those who believe but have no works or bad works is a new category of person that John's Gospel has never really hypothesized thus far. And, and also you have the problem of man defining by his own standard 
whether man's works are actually good, bad, or non-existent, or insufficient, which we'll explore later in this series. I'm not, I'm not going to pick up that now, but... There's also those who don't believe, but for all we know, arguably, have lived a more righteous life than believers who have done good works, okay? But it's just that they do not believe, and obviously they must be condemned according to the early verses. So that they have to invent these hypotheticals that, that John has never really hypothesized. So that, that will become more apparent as, as we continue our study in John. So really, the only way that you can say that this verse asserts that doing good works is necessary to legitimize one's salvation the problem is here that you've already assumed that salvation must in, in, involve works. You've already got a works-based salvation. So therefore, you're already reading this through the lens of your assumption rather than allowing the Bible to def define itself. So this is what's called eisegesis. So this is where people read the way they want it to read because they've already got a presupposed doctrine. But instead, what we need to do is interpret it through exegesis and that, that's allowing the Bible to interpret itself. And I'm not deliberately trying to use fancy words, but I'm, I'm just trying to to show you the, the, these two ways of looking at it. So we clearly see that this verse is about the resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. Very specific. It's not dealing with eternal life or the condemnation in a broader sense. So let's look at a parallel passage then that deals with the two resurrections very specifically. And this is in Revelation 20. And Revelation, by the way, was supposedly written by the, the same John who wrote the gospel. So it's a good book to compare, you know, if we assume that John is consistent with his own writings. So John's uh, having his vision in Revelation 20. So starting from verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, this is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So then, when we compare that with John 5.29, remember that, that that contrasted two types of people, okay? Those who have done good onto the resurrection of life, we saw that there, and there's those who have done evil, the resurrection of damnation, we saw that there. Then, in his vision in Revelation, once again, he has portrayed two types of people. Those who are written in the book of life, who are consequently not cast into the lake of fire, because it's whoever was not written in the book was cast, okay? And then there's those who are not written in the book of life, who are consequently judged according to their works, it says, and because of the things written in the other book. So notice there's a singular book, the book of life, and then there's plural books, which were the other books, not the book of life specifically. And the, the dead were judged out of those plural books, multiple books, according to their works. So we have books of works, multiple books, and one book of life. Okay? So, notice something very, very important. Those who were judged by their works are those whose names are not written in the book of life. Okay? And were instead judged out of those things written in the books, plural, according to what? Their works. Okay? Notice also that it is very specifically the judgment of the dead. Okay? Because it doesn't really tell us about the people who weren't judged, who were written in the book of life. It only really tells us about the people who weren't. Okay? It's the dead that were judged here. Because Jesus said in John eleven twenty six, we haven't got there in the series yet, but Jesus said, Whosoever believes in me shall never die. Okay, but it's the dead that are being judged here. And a few slides ago, when we looked at the, the span of eternal life, Thessalonians, Paul used the, the phrase asleep rather than dead. Okay, because in a manner of speaking, yeah, we can say they're dead in the flesh. But in the grand scheme of eternity, they're not dead. Okay, they're just asleep. This is the dead that are being judged. Okay. In conclusion, then, the condemnation of those who were judged according to their works is specifically attributed to those who are dead okay but jesus promised that those who believe in him shall never die okay therefore they must not be included in this judgment this is also consistent with what john said um earlier in his gospel jesus said he that believes on me not he that does not believe on me is already condemned okay that's what he says already condemned not he will be condemned he's already condemned okay now an objection that people will throw to this is that obviously because revelation uh, 20, 12 to 15, it gives us no explanation of actually 
how or why someone's name is written in the book of life to begin with. But obviously, the, the the Bible does talk about names being blotted out. So they, they'll wonder, well, surely it's possible then for Christians who will be judged according to their works, as their name could be blotted out of the book of life. Now, this objection is understandable because of the fact that the Bible never mentions getting your name written in the book of life as a salvation instruction. Sometimes I have heard preachers, when they're giving the gospel, say you need to get your name written in the book of life. The Bible never actually says get your name written in it. It only ever really warns about having your name blotted out or, or your part in the book of life taken away or, or not being found written in the book of life. But the thing is, the book of Revelation as a whole, not not the specific chapter, but the Revelation as a whole already explained before chapter 20 by giving as a condition that Christ will keep somebody's name written in the book of life. So let's have a look at what that is. So in Revelation 3, 5, it says, He that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So we clearly see that he who overcomes, whoever that is, will not have his name blotted out. It won't happen. He's overcome. Okay, well, then the question is, how do we overcome? Okay, well, have another, another look at a verse from Revelation 12, 11. And they, which in the context is the brethren, overcame him, who's that, the devil, by what? By their works? No. By their obedience? No. By the blood of the Lamb. Okay, that's referring to Jesus' blood. It's what Jesus did, his death on the cross. And by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. So they overcame what? By the blood of the Lamb. Okay, that's Jesus. Okay, now also obviously the word of their testimony, which still points to Jesus. And they loved not their lives unto death, which it's too early to explain exactly what that means, but this will actually become more apparent uh, in our later study of John. I think uh, when we get to chapter 12, I think that will crop up and, and we can understand exactly what that means. But it's it's not by their own works of righteousness, it's by the blood of the Lamb. Okay, it's all about what Christ did. It's not about what they did themselves. Okay, now Revelation would obviously need its own study to understand this in more depth. So let, let, for now, let's bring it back to John's Gospel so we don't digress too far from the intended passage. But by comparing it with Revelation in the context of resurrection, we can see then what it means to do good and do evil. So when John 5.29 says, they that have done good... The resurrection of life. Well, we saw in Revelation that that's whose names Jesus kept in the book of life because they overcame by his blood, which is synonymous with they believed on him. Okay. And then there's those who have done evil onto the resurrection of damnation. Well, that's those who were not found in the book of life and were judged by their works. Okay. According to the other books that were written. Okay. So we obviously haven't established the relationship between believing on him and overcoming by his blood. Um, we haven't yet got to the crucial passages in the Bible that would deal with that. So obviously I'm only summarizing shortly, but the, the whole point that the Bible's trying to get across to you here is that our salvation is all about Christ. It's about Jesus. It's about what he did. Okay. We have to believe on him because we cannot have any faith in our own obedience. We overcome by his blood not by our blood okay it's his righteousness his obedience it doesn't matter how obedient you want to claim that you are okay you can overcome by your works okay you do not want to be judged by your works unless you are a sanctimonious narcissistic self-righteous fool it's that simple so you know if you want to be judged by your works you will not overcome because you will be classed as those who have done evil you need to overcome by Christ's blood you need to believe in him and not trust in your own obedience. Now, look, yes, we should follow Jesus' commandments. Absolutely, we should obey his commandments. Yes, we should be seek to be like to be like him, but not for our salvation, not to justify our eternal life, because we can only be justified by his righteousness imputed unto us, not by our righteousness. So continuing then in John 5, um, between 30 to 37, uh, I haven't really brought out all these verses because Jesus explains the witnesses that testify of him, but there's nothing to cover in terms of how to actually be saved. Now, verse 34 does allude to this by saying, I receive not the testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. But that that's really sort of directed to the crowd that he's talking to, that he doesn't require the testimony of man, but he refers to it so that people might believe that testimony and get saved. But, but for us, there's not really any salvation instructions that we need to unpack from there.
Well, in verse 13, I, re- I realise I've not included the, the previous context, but Jesus is talking to the, the crowd of Jews and continuing this conversation, and he says, And you have not his word abiding in you, for whom he has sent, him you believe not. So it's too early in John's Gospel to unpack this verse just yet, but when we look at John 15, this issue about abiding will re-emerge, and, and John 15 is a, a, a go-to passage for the teachers of conditional security, and um, they use it to teach that you can lose salvation because Jesus does warn about abiding in him and the risk of being cut off from the vine and cast into the fire. Um, advocates usually have insist that our works and our watchful endurance are our responsibility in order to abide in Christ. So obviously John 15 will need its own detailed study to properly understand it. When we do, we, we will need to come back to this first. This will be very crucial. But for now, what we can take from this verse is that the key point here is that having Christ's word abiding in you is equated with believing. Okay, It's not equated with works of obedience or some kind of endurance or fight. It's our belief. It's what we believe. That will be very important when we study the implications of John 15, um, when, when it will deal with the issue of abiding and being cut off. But I'll, I'll hold it there for now. You'll just have to wait for the John 15 study to, to unpack that. So then continuing in verse 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me and you will not come to me that you might have life. So obviously lots of people think they have eternal life according to the scriptures. Jesus is saying otherwise, but then the question is why is that? Now the scriptures testify of Jesus, but what's the issue here? The issue is that many people will not come to him uh, which they might have life, which we assume means eternal life because that's just continuing the context in verses 29 and 34 in this same conversation. So notice the issue is not that they would not turn from all their sins or they would not walk down the path of righteousness or they just could not grasp salvation doctrine because it was too complicated and they just didn't learn to understand it. The issue is they would not come to Jesus for everlasting life. And this is synonymous with not believing on him, which we will see when we do a study of chapter six, this uh, sort of equate equation between believing on him and coming to him the scriptures point to christ okay he is the one that we need to believe in yes they tell us to do works but they don't point to our works as the means of our salvation okay so then continuing in verse 41 i receive not honor from men but i know you that you have not the love of god in you i am come in my father's name and you receive me not if another shall come in his own name him you will receive how can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from god only do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Now, this is obviously more directed at a Jewish audience. Um, It's perhaps not as much of a stumbling block for a Christian audience, because obviously in our Bibles we, we use both the Old and the New Testament. Some Christians have a bit of a stupid attitude about the Old Testament and how it, you know it's not as important or they don't like it or whatever. But for the most part, it's more of a stumbling block for Jews, really, that supposedly they trust in Moses, but not in Christ. But then Christ is saying, if you would have believed Moses, you would have believed me. It's that simple. And, and where this does apply to Christians is that a lot of Christians mistakenly believe that the Jews get a free pass on being God's chosen people for no other reason than being Jewish or believing the Old Testament. But Jesus was very clear that they don't even believe what was written in the Old Testament, because if they did, then by default, they would believe in Jesus and his words. Okay, And and the problem is that people think I sound mean when I say that. But a lot of Christians have this attitude that the Jews are okay, we don't need to preach the gospel to them, and it's just that's not loving them okay just like the muslims or the catholics or the hindus or anybody else they need the gospel okay they need to believe on christ there is no salvation in any other name okay so then this concludes our study of john 5 and continues to agree with john 3 and 4 that salvation is by believing and this will continue to be strengthened in chapter 6 where we'll get some extremely important passages to set foundations for dealing with the issue of those who fall away okay in relation to conditional versus eternal security. Um, Obviously, he has used some trickier language here, but we've been able to rectify it with the Bible to prove that it's not a contradiction at all and it's not saying two different things. So um, hopefully soon I'll have the John 6 study ready for you and it will be put in the playlist um, as part of the, the whole series playlist.